1839 and some chap has just ordered the destruction of some opium. Lin Seshu was the name of this man, a Chinese official who'd confiscated the opium from a man called Charles Elliot. The British had been making a lot of money selling it to the Chinese because opium is incredibly addictive. The Chinese government had banned its import and sale because it was ruining the country, but that didn't stop the British because money. Seshu had hoped that this open display of defiance would deter the British from continuing to sell opium to China. He was wrong. As a result, Elliot, who oversaw all British trade with China, ordered the withdrawal of all British men and ships from Canton and out of the country. The British were furious that the Chinese thought that they were allowed to tell them what to do in China, and so they mobilised the Royal Navy for war. Seshu wasn't concerned about war since he felt that the British would only win at sea, but on land the Chinese were safe. The British fleet arrived at the island of Zhou Shan here in 1840 and demanded that it surrender. The inhabitants said no and dug in for a long siege. On July the 5th at 2.30 the Royal Navy began its bombardment and by 2.39 the bombardment was over and the island's defences were completely destroyed. The British then took the island with no further resistance. The first opium war had begun in earnest. The Chinese, led by the Daoguang Emperor of the Qing Dynasty, didn't take the war or the British very seriously at first. A part of this came from the entrenched Chinese belief that all foreigners were barbarians who were destined to live under the of the Emperor. This is demonstrated by the fact that during the war they referred to the British not as foreigners but as rebels. The British, under the leadership of Foreign Secretary Lord Palmerston, expected the war to be a difficult one. It was about two things. The first was obviously the right to continue selling opium to the Chinese. The second was to end the idea of Chinese superiority and to be seen by the Imperial Court as equals in all things. Anywho, while sailing up the Chinese coast, the Royal Navy had attempted to deliver a letter of their peace terms to the Emperor. The Emperor largely ignored these demands and instead decided that Britain would be happy if Lin Seshu was removed. He had him replaced with a man called Qi Shan who met Elliot in late 1840 to discuss terms. Qi Shan promised that a peaceful solution could be found and told the Brits to simply wait until the Emperor deigned to reply to them. Months passed and the British were unhappy to wait anymore and so in early 1841, back to fighting. The British were victorious at the Battle of Chunpi and Qi Shan and Elliot met to discuss terms in late January. Elliot demanded Hong Kong, the reopening of the opium trade in Canton, a bunch of cash and for the British to be recognised as equals. The Emperor said no and had Qi Shan arrested and replaced him with two men, the Emperor's cousin Yi Shan and a general called Yang Fang. Their task was simple, crush the British entirely. The intensity of fighting picked up soon after this and by March the British were sitting outside of Canton. Yang Fang agreed to allow the British to trade there again in return for the soldiers leaving, which they did. The Emperor was furious and removed Yang Fang and demanded that Yi Shan now destroy the British, because that's how that worked. Canton was reinforced while the British took defensive positions around the city. Yi Shan attacked the British on the 21st of May, he was repelled and about a week later the city was captured by the British and looted. During this battle, the Qing forces outnumbered the British about 50,000 to 6,000. So why did the British win? The two main reasons were technology and training. Whilst China had been the birthplace of gunpowder, most Qing soldiers were equipped with spears or bows and those that had guns had old matchlock muskets. Whereas the British had much newer weaponry and their soldiers were also very well trained and were often veterans of other conflicts, unlike the Qing who were mostly peasant conscripts who sometimes fought bandits. This discrepancy was much larger at sea where British warships were of much better quality than the Chinese ships called junk that they faced. The British had also bought with them a brand new warship, the HMS Nemesis, which was an iron-hulled, steam-powered warship which outclassed anything the Qing could throw at them. The pattern of a much larger Qing force being defeated by a small yet technologically superior British force continued throughout the rest of the war. Over the next year, the British captured many coastal cities and forts. In mid-1842, the British captured Qing Kiang, which meant that they could blockade the Yangtze River and China's Grand Canal, which meant that food couldn't be shipped across the empire. The emperor thus decided to sue for peace with Britain, and they both signed the Treaty of Nanking. The terms were that trade would now go through these cities as well as Canton, and that this trade would include opium. That China would pay Britain what is technically known as a boatload of money and that Hong Kong would be ceded to Britain as well. In return, the Chinese got sweet nothing and this treaty is referred to as the first unequal treaty. For China, the Treaty of Nanking marks the beginning of a period known as the Century of Humiliation in which China would suffer internal rebellions and degrading foreign interventions, one of which was the Second Opium War, but that's for another video. I hope you enjoyed this episode and thank you for watching and a special thanks to Winston K. Wood, James Bizonette, Azarka Flash, Henry Rabung, Adam Harvey and Sky Chappelle. If you'd like to learn more about the First Opium War, then there are some book recommendations in the description below.